Peter Underwood's Ghost Watch. Let me take you back to 1946 and the true story of a ghostly experience at the old airdrome at Montrose. It was dead of night and a young serviceman was on his first tour of duty, guarding the hangars and the airdrome. The duty was done in pairs, and to reach the hangars they had to pass and check the morgue. As you would imagine, this was done as quickly as possible. All was well, so the serviceman and his companion decided to pop over to a deserted spot and treat themselves to a quiet smoke. They went one at a time, leaving the other on guard. The new man found himself alone, and suddenly the doors of the morgue, which you remember they had checked, locked, burst open. He saw a figure emerge. It was an airman, dressed in an old-fashioned flying suit, complete with helmet and goggles. Airman was rooted to the spot. Petrified with fear, he dropped his rifle. When he bent to pick it up, the airman vanished, and to his astonishment he heard a loud bang as the morgue doors closed. Years later, he was talking to another man who had been stationed at Montrose and learned that the ghostly airman had, years before, emerged from the building, later converted to the morgue, to walk to his plane for his last flight. The airman is thought to have crashed on the perimeter of the airfield in 1913. And in fact, the ghostly biplane was also seen by Sir Peter Maysfield in 1963. As he was flying over Montrose, he saw ahead of him an ancient biplane with a helmeted and begoggled pilot in the open cockpit. Suddenly, part of the top starboard wing folded up and the flimsy plane crashed to the ground. Later, he told me, he had discovered that he had witnessed the reenactment of a tragedy that had taken place exactly 50 years after the fatal accident. I'm Peter Underwood, and I'll be back on the Ghost Watch soon. Peter Underwood's Ghost Watch. Lord Dufferin, an ex Viceroy of India, was spending the weekend with an old friend in Ireland when, around midnight, he found himself restless and wide awake. He opened his bedroom window and looked out over the lawns, and his eyes caught a movement in the moonlight. As he watched, he saw the figure of a man step from the shadow. It was bent almost double by the weight of a long and heavy box he carried on his back, a coffin. As the figure made his painful way across the lawn, it stopped and looked straight up at Lord Dufferin. The moon shone on its face, with features so horrible that the ex-Viceroy shuddered when their eyes met. He described the faces full of horror and malevolence. Some years later, when Lord Dufferin was ambassador to France, he was discussing a meeting on the fifth floor of a Paris hotel. Accompanied by his secretary, he joined others waiting for the lift. It rattled to a stop and the doors opened. Deep in conversation, Lord Dufferin started to enter the lift. As he stepped forward, he looked at the face of the lift attendant. With a sudden shock of amazement, Lord Dufferin stepped back out of the lift. The face was the same one he'd seen in Ireland carrying a coffin across the lawn. Lord Dufferin felt a chill dread seep into him. He was visibly shaken and much to the astonishment of the hotel manager, he waved the lift away, refusing to step inside. The lift started its descent, when suddenly there was a harsh clang, a loud banging noise, followed by an awful screech and a tremendous thud that seemed to vibrate through the hotel. The wire suspension cable had snapped, and the loaded lift plunged at the bottom of the shaft. Five people died, among them the lift operator, whose face had saved Lord Dufferin's life. I'm Peter Underwood, and I'll be back with Ghost Watch soon. Peter Underwood's Ghost Watch. We spend almost a third of our lives asleep and dreaming, a strange and still largely unexplained condition, and occasionally dreams and ghosts seem to intermingle and overlap in a disconcerting fashion. Sir Harold Bolton, who wrote the Sky Boat Song, always vouched for the authenticity of a very strange story. When he was a boy, Harold's mother had a recurring dream of a house set in beautiful gardens. Inside, the decoration and the contents were of the finest quality. She spoke of her dream often, and after a while seemed to know every corner of the house. However, gradually the dream became less frequent and finally ceased altogether. 
and here my tale would end, were it not for a strange coincidence. Some years later, Sir Harold bought Ballyhoolish House in Scotland. His mother was to live with him, and he took her up to see the property. But she had already seen it. In fact, she knew it like the back of her hand. The Ballyhoolish House was the house of her dreams. The former owner, Lady Beresford, showed them round, and Mrs Bolton then discovered several things were different. She asked about a fireplace, a window, a doorway, and in every case, Lady Beresford said, oh yes, it used to be like that, but we altered it. But the strangest thing of all happened as they were about to leave. Lady Beresford took Mrs Bolton on one side and said, my dear, you won't mind me mentioning it, will you? But you're the ghostly little lady that used to haunt Ballyhoolish House some years ago. I heard this tale from Alistair MacGregor, former secretary to the Duchy of Lancaster, who knew the Boltons, and Ballyhoolish House stands to this day. I'm Peter Underwood, and I'll be back on Ghost Watch soon. Peter Underwood's Ghost Watch. A few years ago, I spent a night at Newark Park in Gloucestershire, a house where strange rustling sounds, as though a person dressed in trailing clothes was moving around, had been reported many times. Fearful visitors had also heard disembodied voices. Clear and distinct footsteps echoed along deserted passageways. The sound of rattling chains was reported, and there was talk of an unnatural coldness. I had gone there with other investigators to ghost watch. That first night, we concentrated on a staircase landing where the rustling and voices had been heard from time to time for over 70 years. In half an hour, four members of our team heard it. We waited for voices, but no luck. We decided to sit again in the same place, and this time take with us recording equipment together with a camera loaded with infrared film that takes photographs in darkness. We hoped that even if we saw nothing, the camera might pick up whatever might be there. The recorder was running, the camera ready, but we heard nothing. The next day, we ran the tape through, just in case the recorder had picked up anything we hadn't heard. There were two faint but distinct voices on the tape. A man's voice said, it's looking, and a woman's, it's looking at us. Could they have been talking about the camera lens pointing at them? It's a pity we didn't take any pictures. Those voices remain a mystery and a lasting reminder of our ghost hunt in the Cotswolds. I'm Peter Underwood. I'll be back on Ghost Watch soon. Peter Underwood's Ghost Watch. In October 1880, Lady Helen Waldegrave visited Antony House in Cornwall with her reserved Scottish maid, Helen Alexander. A few days after their arrival, Helen Alexander was taken ill. She quickly grew worse, and a doctor diagnosed typhoid fever. One of the housemaids, a Frances Reddle, was detailed to look after her. At four o'clock one morning, just as Frances was preparing a dose of medicine for the patient, she was surprised to see an elderly and stout lady enter the bedroom without knocking. Even more surprising to the puzzled Francis was the fact that the woman was dressed in a long red nightgown over a flannel petticoat and she carried an unusually ornate brass candlestick. The observant maid even noticed, with some disapproval, a definite hole in the petticoat. The figure did not acknowledge Francis's presence in the room, but went straight to the bedside. Assuming that Helen Alexander's mother had been sent for, Francis turned away to finish making up the medicine. When she looked up again, the figure had vanished. However, Helen was much worse and shortly afterwards died. Two days later, the dead girl's family arrived for the funeral. When Frances Reddle saw Helen's mother, she nearly fainted. This stout, elderly, motherly figure was the apparition she had seen on the night Helen died. After the funeral, 
Frances told her story to the dead girl's sister, who confirmed that her mother did possess a nightgown and a red flannel petticoat, and furthermore there was a hole in the petticoat, and her mother used an ornate brass candlestick, exactly as Frances described. A living ghost? Or could it be that the figure Frances had seen had been projected from the mind of the dying Helen? Who knows? I'm Peter Underwood. I'll be back on Ghost Watch soon. Peter Underwood's Ghost Watch. At the end of the 18th century, Sir Godfrey Hazlitt married the beautiful Lady Evelyn Carew, and a great feast followed at Bastwick Place in Norfolk. At midnight, that 31st of May, the terrified and struggling bride was kidnapped by a rival suitor and borne away in a coach towards Potter Hyam. Imagine the scene, the coach careering over the road as the horses were urged on ever faster, sparks flying from the wheels as they struck the flint on the track, and the carriage swaying from side to side with a frightened girl inside. Up ahead, the narrow Potter Hyam bridge. The coach was out of control. It struck the stone wall, shattered into a thousand pieces, and the occupants, horses and all, were flung over the parapet into the River Thurn below. And each 31st of May, it said, the coach, silent at first but frighteningly visible, approaches Potter Hyam Bridge at breakneck speed. It strikes the stone wall with an ear-splitting crack, is flung high into the air and falls to pieces in the river below. Those who have witnessed this spectacle said their blood froze in their veins. Dr Charles Sampson himself told me he saw it, with two friends who confirmed his story. But I have visited Potter Hyam Bridge on the fateful night of May the 31st, and each time it's been quiet and peaceful, and I haven't seen a thing. Phantom appearances like this seem to run down eventually, almost like a battery. So perhaps the phantom coach of Potter Hyam has finally made its last run. I'm Peter Underwood, and I'll be back on Ghost Watch soon. Peter Underwood's Ghost Watch. Marl Hall Landidno is thought to have inspired Thomas Hood to write his frightening poem, The Haunted House. And nearby, a small hotel used to have a very haunted room. One night, a guest, returning to his room, noticed a depression on the vacant bed, as though an invisible person was lying there. Later, while he himself was resting, he suddenly had the feeling he was not alone. It was dark, and he put out his hand to switch on the light and touched what felt like a human head with dripping wet hair. Another visitor, staying in the same room, was disturbed by the sound of slow, lumbering, shuffling footsteps that padded around the room, although the visitor was alone there. One afternoon, this guest went out for a walk. As it began to get dark, he heard the same slow, shuffling footsteps he had heard before. They seemed to be following him. He turned round, but nothing was there. He ran on and then stopped several times, and each time he heard the footsteps, although nothing was visible. On the day he was leaving the hotel, he told the proprietor about his experiences. The middle-aged hotelier had an explanation. It appeared, when they were young, he and his wife had had a deformed and mentally retarded son. The boy was gentle and affectionate, but his mind never developed beyond that of an infant. One night, two young lovers left the hotel for a walk in the moonlight along the path our visitor had taken. Unbeknown to them, the proprietor's son had followed them. When he loomed out of the darkness, they were terrified and fled. The boy was never seen alive again, but two days later his battered body was found among the rocks at the foot of some cliffs nearby, and it was after this tragedy that strange happenings were repeatedly reported from the boy's old bedroom. I'm Peter Underwood. I'll be back on the Ghost Watch soon. Peter Underwood's Ghost Watch. In 
In October 1693, Sir Tristram and Lady Beresford were visiting Dublin. One morning, Lady Beresford came downstairs, seeming agitated and disturbed. Her husband asked after her health, and then questioned her about her wrist, which he noticed was bound with a black ribbon. Lady Beresford begged Sir Tristram not to question her about the ribbon, but said, you will never see me without it. That morning, she had had a premonition that her friend, Lord Tyrone, was dead, that he died, in fact, on the previous Tuesday. And sure enough, confirmation arrived that day. Lord Tyrone had indeed died on the previous Tuesday. For the rest of her life, Lady Beresford was never seen without the black ribbon on her wrist. And it was not until she was on her deathbed that she related the reason to her children. On the morning that Sir Tristram had questioned her, she had suddenly found herself wide awake. Sitting beside her bed, she saw her friend, Lord Tyrone, who told her of his death. She asked for some convincing sign that she was not dreaming, whereupon he hooked up the bed hangings in an unusual manner and wrote his signature in her pocketbook. Lady Beresford was still not convinced and asked for more proof. Then Lord Tyrone placed his hand which was as cold as marble, on her wrist for a second, and immediately the sinews shrank and withered at the touch. Lady Beresford wore the black ribbon round her wrist to hide the withered skin. She instructed her children, after her death, to unbind the ribbon and look at her wrist. When they did so, they discovered their mother's wrist was as she had described. Lady Elizabeth Cobb, the granddaughter of Lady Beresford, preserved both the ribbon and the ghostly signature at her home in Bath for many years. I'm Peter Underwood. I'll be back on the Ghost Watch soon. Peter Underwood's Ghost Watch. Among the hundreds of ancient and haunted houses in England, 12th century Beely Abbey in Essex is especially full of atmosphere. In particular, the haunted room with its enormous four-poster made for James I, its massive furniture, heavy oak beams and dark corners. It is reputed to be haunted by the ghost of Sir John Gate, once the owner of Beely Abbey. He may have entertained Lady Jane Grey there. At all events, he was beheaded on Tower Green because of his involvement with the Nine Days Queen. His ghost still walks, it is said, each 22nd of August, the anniversary of his death in 1553. The house has been owned for years now by the Foyle family, and some years ago, Christina Foyle decided she would sleep in the haunted room, despite the fact that it had not been used for over 50 years. She did so and told me of her harrowing, never-to-be-forgotten experience. All went well until about three o'clock in the morning when Christina woke. The room was vibrating. Everything seemed to be shuddering and even the water jug spilled over. It was no dream or imagination. It was all really happening. When Christina pulled herself together, she eventually got out of bed and looked in the mirror. She discovered that she had two red tooth marks on her shoulder near the neck and another two on her fingers. When a doctor saw the wounds, slight as they were, he suggested she lost no time in going to hospital. There she had a minor operation and was told that her finger had been affected by a germ unknown for 20 years. The haunted room is empty now and Christina Foyle tells me she will never sleep in it again, nor will she let anyone else. I'm Peter Underwood. I'll be back on Ghost Watch soon. Peter Underwood's Ghost Watch. Borley Rectory in Essex, which was built in 1863, was known as the most haunted house in England until it was destroyed by fire in 1938. Every single person who ever lived in this rambling red brick property asserted that they heard, saw and experienced ghostly happenings. 
there were dozens of ghostly sightings of a ghost nun and a coach and horses. A nun had, apparently, been caught eloping with a brother from a nearby monastery in the 17th century. They were chased and caught. The brother was hanged and the nun bricked up alive. Was it she who haunted the rectory? As I said, each person who lived at Borley talked of a ghostly experience. And one sighting of the nun was by four sisters who were returning from a garden party one July afternoon. They all saw her from different vantage points in the garden at the same time. A later rector at Borley poured scorn upon the ghosts, saying it was pointless wandering about aimlessly, making footsteps and other noises and moving objects about. After he died, he said, he would try to reappear with a positive action, like throwing mothballs about, so that those alive would know that it were he. Twenty years later, the rector, long dead and buried, the house was empty and was in fact the subject of a scientific study of the supernatural. One day, a party of investigators arrived at the house and when they opened the door, they were greeted by a hail of mothballs. Even after the rectory was burnt to the ground, the site was repeatedly reported to be haunted by the ghost of the restless, tragic young nun. I'm Peter Underwood. I'll be back on the Ghost Watch soon. Peter Underwood's Ghost Watch. On 13th of February, 1748, a schooner, the Lady Lovibond, sailed down the Thames bound for Oporto. Captain Simon Reed and his new wife, together with other guests, were making merry in the captain's cabin. But up on deck, first mate John Rivers nursed his hatred and jealousy, for he had been a rival for the affections of the captain's beautiful wife. His morbid thoughts precipitated an action that is renowned. For John Rivers casually picked up a belaying pin and shattered the helmsman's skull. Unnoticed, he took the helm himself and swung the Lady Lovey Bond over. With a grinding crash, the schooner hit the Goodwin Sands. The masts snapped and toppled into the sea. The timbers split like matchwood. And amid the din, the doomed ship rang with the mad laughter of the unrequited suitor, John Rivers. By first light, on the 14th of February, 1748, the Lady Lovey Bond and all aboard had been sucked into the Goodwin Sands forever. Or had she? Fifty years later, to the day, Captain James Westlake, aboard the coasting vessel Edenbridge, was skirting the Goodwins when he caught sight of a three-masted schooner bearing down on him with sails set. As the ship passed close by, he heard female laughter and other sounds of merrymaking. On the same day, the crew of a fishing vessel told how they saw a similar vessel break up before their eyes. But when they went to the rescue, they discovered nothing but empty sand and water. And every 50 years since 1748, the ghostly Lady Lovibond has been seen re-enacting her last minutes on the Goodwin Sands. She was seen from Deal in 1848 and again in 1898. In 1948, an Italian vessel reported seeing the ghost ship before she herself was wrecked on the treacherous sands. And the next sighting should be in 1998, when researchers with sophisticated equipment will attempt to record for all time the sight and sound of the tragic event which happened so long ago. This is Peter Underwood. I'll be back on Ghost Watch soon. Peter Underwood's Ghost Watch. Serious psychical researchers always hope to obtain proof of the supernatural, either on camera or tape. Such proof was obtained from the old Bircham Newton RAF station. When I looked into the story, I discovered that the sounds of disembodied footsteps had been heard in the viewing gallery, and a heavy sigh had not only been heard, but recorded. There were other unexplained events too, 
the figure of a man in RAF uniform, which vanished as one witness watched. He fled. One summer evening, this witness returned to Bircham Newton with a friend. They found the place deserted, but extremely cold and rather frightening. They placed recording apparatus on the floor of the building, set it running and left, staying within sight of the only door to the building. 25 minutes later, they returned. They had not heard a single sound, but the recording held sounds of an aircraft flying overhead, muffled voices, and what seemed to be heavy objects being dragged across the floor. Following exhaustive research and investigation, we discovered that the appearance of the ghost airman had been seen on a number of occasions, and sometimes he'd walked through a wall, a wall built after the Second World War. We discovered that an Anson had crashed at Bircham Newton, killing the three occupants who'd been based to the airfield. The crash was not reported at the time. It's thought that the ghostly airman was trying to draw attention to the crash which happened in the war. I'm Peter Underwood. I'll be back on Ghost Watch soon. Peter Underwood's Ghost Watch. You may have heard of Christiana Brand, the writer of thriller stories and children's books. I first met her at a literary dinner when she told me of her one and only experience of a ghost, an unusual one a ghost dog. Her first job as a governess, straight from school, was to look after two small children at Weybridge. Their mother was marrying again and sent the children to stay with an aunt and uncle they had not met before. Christiana, of course, knew nothing about the family. After the children were in bed on the first evening, she joined the family for dinner. All seemed normal. The aunt at one end of the table, the uncle at the other, with what Christiana described to me as a big, curly-haired, lovable old Airedale lying at his master's feet. Sadly, the next morning, Christiana was woken with the news that the children's uncle had died suddenly during the night. A year later, she mentioned the dog to the aunt's son. What happened to your Airedale? And went on to describe the contented scene on his father's last night. And as she told me, she was surprised and puzzled to discover that although the family had owned an Airedale, exactly as she had seen, the dog had died three years before her visit to the aunt and uncle. Christiana could not explain how she'd seen the dog that night, but as she said, so many people all down the ages have claimed to see ghosts that I don't see how we can entirely disbelieve. Perhaps it's as a famous priest once said, if we do brush against the curtain of death, it's presumptuous to think it has anything to do with us. It's an accident. I'm Peter Underwood. Goodbye. <laughs>